Cool. All right. So last talk of the day. Uh, so the opening ceremony, right? It's, it's this thing that we have at the beginning of almost every hackathon, and it's just something that's been in place for some time now. Uh, and I think that it is one of the most important parts, if not the most important part of your hackathon. Uh, and it's, it's a time where you have everyone in the same room, uh, you can address everyone at the same time, there's definitely a lot that can go wrong, your schedule can fall to shit, um, and it's, it's definitely a very lucrative spot uh, for sponsorship dollars, right? Sponsors love to pay money to address everyone in the room. Uh, so given all of this, uh, I want to share some thoughts that I've had. Uh, this has been building up for a while on like, uh, how I think we can keep the opening ceremony cool at the scale that we're growing hackathons at. So quick, uh, I'm Eddie Zaneski. I have the privilege of serving as a developer evangelist at a company called Twilio. Uh, I, was the, uh, I organized three hack RUs when I was at Rutgers University. Uh, woo, go RU. Uh, and that is my internet uh, name on Twitter and all that stuff. Uh, and if you think that I'm holding a sword in that picture, I'm sorry to inform you I'm changing a light bulb because it's a tall person joke. So. All right, so the purpose of the opening ceremony. So why do we even do this, right? Like I said, there's a lot that can go wrong. And so I really want to establish like, uh, the fundamental reason that I think we've had the opening ceremony uh, with everyone in the same room. So the obvious fact is it is a great welcome and a, uh, a time where you can communicate things to your attendees. Uh, there's a chance that your attendees have been on a bus, for like six hours, 10 hours, been on a plane, uh, and they need to get hyped, right? They're very tired, they're very low energy, they may have traveled quite a distance to come, uh, and they're about to spend the next 36 hours building cool shit without sleeping. So it's a great time for you to get everyone hyped up in the same room. Uh, and it's a great time for uh, sponsors to address everyone in the room, right? We talked about how this is lucrative, we'll talk about that more. Um, and it's a way that you can communicate the logistics, right? This is probably the only time everyone is in the same room. Even the closing people tend to like taper off. But I think the most important part uh, and the reason we have the opening ceremony uh, is to inspire and equip everyone in that room. And this is something that we say at Twilio a lot. It's actually the mission of our company. Um, and what I want you to think about is that uh, just about 50% of the hackers in your hackathon are going to be first-time hackers. These are people who have never been to a hackathon before. They don't know the ideas uh, that we think are trivial, right? Last year, the big thing for uh, hackathons were building power gloves. Uh, they didn't know that like, a power glove was a thing. Thing. So you have to remember that these people need some sort of inspiration to draw on. Maybe they were brought here with a friend, uh, maybe they worked up the courage to come on themselves, uh, but it's important that we inspire these uh, developers that are in this room who are about to embark on an incredible journey on the kinds of things that they should expect to do and work on and see at the end of this time. Uh, and we should also equip them. Uh, so this is where the, the sponsors come in. So the, the sponsors are bringing cool technology, MLH is bringing the hardware lab. Uh, those people need to be equipped and briefed uh, by the fact that there's gonna be mentors there to help them. So there will be people all over this hackathon uh, with tools and uh, techno technologies that they can use. So as is tradition, a uh, quick story about my first hackathon. It was HackRU Spring 2013 when I first transferred to Rutgers. Um, and there were some folks like this guy with these weird cat ears on, uh, who was an evangelist for SendGrid at the time. And there was this guy who was an evangelist for Twilio at the time and some old GitHubbers. Um, and this is Shapeways, this is an API where you can do 3D printing. And this is my good buddy uh, Mitchell Twani, uh, who worked at Mashery, uh, Intel Mashery. It was even before Intel acquired them, it was an API company for APIs. Uh, and what I realized going through all these pictures was all of these folks were extremely technical. Uh, all the sponsors at That Hack Are You and the one after it were all technical sponsors. They were these companies that were focused on developers. They, their customers were developers. And what I realized is this made sense, right? These, these types of developer-focused companies were the early adopters of hackathon sponsorships. They're the ones who went in and had people kick the tires on their product. This whole uh, marketing to developers and selling things to developers was a very new thing. So this was a great way for them to step in as the early adopters. So a lot has changed since then. Uh, and I think one of the biggest turning points is uh, MHEX2 in the big house. Uh, they sent a bus for uh, 80 Rutgers students to get on and brought us to their hackathon. This blew our minds. This had never been done before. So I'd love to talk uh, later about like, the history of hackathons and how we've grown. But I think this was a very pivotal moment when we actually started bringing people to different hackathons. So hackathons have not only grown in size, but they've grown in quantity quite a bit. We have over almost 200 events this year with MLH. Uh, and due to this, sponsors are spread extremely thin. 
Uh, we, we've heard from John Britton and lots of folks that we just we can't scale ourselves that way. We can't be at every hackathon every weekend. We need weekends off. Uh, and so what this has done is that the uh, the game has been opened up for new players. So there's been a lot of new sponsors walking onto the field. Just today, I learned that uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken sponsored a hackathon in Louisville, Kentucky, which is awesome. Yeah, right? So who would think that Kentucky Fried Chicken, would? they had engineers here that they brought. So the fact that there's so many new companies uh, coming into the sponsorship game, this is becoming a household thing. This is something that your kids are going to know about, they're going to talk about. Uh, the media talks about this. Uh, we just had a hackathon on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, so bankers know about this stuff now. So this is all happening. Uh, and and what, a lot of these companies have uh, APIs as a product or a strategy, uh, and, and they're not really like developer-focused companies, right? So they, they're here to do recruiting, uh, and they have something that they want developers to play with, but that's not their customer. Uh, and this is a great thing. This isn't a bad thing, uh, because it's, it's brought tons of resources for events. These companies have lots of money that they're giving you. Uh, they want to recruit your hackers. Right? It's excellent to have them here. And it's also been some not great things. Uh, this has had a very negative impact on the opening ceremony. Uh, and this is something I've noticed for quite some time. I go to a lot of hackathons. I'm sure I've seen a lot of you before. Uh, and the opening ceremony has grown extremely long. It's very easy to run off schedule. It can be very boring. Uh, there's like very sleeper talk sometimes. You just can't help it. Uh, and there's a lot of like overly salesy pitches. And, and the worst part is I think that there's so many PowerPoints happening now. Uh, and, and as a result, we've seen a rise in uh, hacker demos at the end of a hackathon who are showing off PowerPoints of their projects instead of cutting right to the demo. So I think this is definitely a negative impact. Uh, and so what can we do about it? Well, hackathons need those sponsorship dollars, right? I'm not telling you not to take these companies, right? They want to pay you lots of money and you should take it and be very happy with it. Uh, but there's some things we can do to make sure that everyone gets the best value out of it. We can make sure to go back to our roots of inspiring and equipping your hackers that are in the hackathon. And so I think the first thing that we can do is we can balance time. And this is so, uh, you have your opening ceremony, you, you know you can fit like 10 companies that are able to do uh, talks or demos. And so I want to encourage you to reserve some of those spots for companies that you know will bring an inspirational or an equipping demo. They're going to show off a technology, they're going to build something. And make it affordable for them to come. Maybe like reserve one or two, but keep that in, in the opening ceremony. It's very important for the hackers in the room. Uh, and sponsors actually don't know what they want until you tell them. This is what Nick told me last night. Uh, and the fact that if you don't put like opening ceremony as an option on the prospectus, they're not going to think about it and ask you for it, right? They'll be very happy like sponsoring your dinner or your ice cream truck or something else. Uh, so be very, you can be selective with these companies. If you've, you've been to a hackathon before and a company hasn't had a great opening ceremony presence, uh, it's something that you can just take off the prospectus when you're sending it to them. But I think the biggest thing that we can all do, and this is something we all need to agree to do, is to help educate our sponsors. Uh, the sponsors uh, definitely want the most value. Uh, the hackers want to get the most value. It, it can be beneficial to everybody. This isn't just sponsors like taking tons of money and not doing anything. Uh, everyone can re uh, benefit and reap the rewards of these companies being at your hackathon. And so whether a company is sponsoring their first hackathon or their 200th hackathon, uh, I, don't, I don't think it would hurt at all for you to provide them some tips or tricks or just even ask what they're planning on doing in their opening time. Uh, and you may be thinking that you, you can't like, tell a Microsoft or a Google or a Twilio like, what to do during their opening ceremony. Uh, but the fact is you actually can, and you can present it in a very approachable way that doesn't sound challenging at all. Just be like, hey, like, I'd love to make sure that you get the best value out of your time on stage. Could you talk about what you want to do? Uh, here are some suggestions I can give you. And this is something you can do, and companies would love to hear it. They want to get the most value out of it. So what I'm getting at is that you can get your sponsors to inspire and equip. You can educate them to get to this point. All right, so show of hands, who looked right at that block of code in the middle? Yeah, a lot of you. Who noticed the typo in the block of code immediately, right? Who even read the top of the screen? Right, very, a couple people, right? So, so what, what this is supposed to show you is that uh, developers are drawn to code. Okay, this is the best thing that you can tell your sponsors to do, to show code in their slides, to write some code on stage if they can. Code is what matters, right? Your attention is just drawn straight to it. We've seen this in the Twilio docs. People scroll past all the text and look for code examples. I'm sure GitHub sees this all the time with readmes. People skip all the introduction and they copy and paste the code examples. So code is important. Encourage them to show code. 
a demo. Uh, it pains me so much to see companies that I love and have an amazing product get up on stage and show a PowerPoint presentation of, their, of what their product can do. And instead of showing you, right, this needs to be a show, don't tell. We learned this all throughout elementary school. Show, don't tell. It's a way that we can inspire these developers and show off what's possible. Uh, it's even better if they're showing something that people can pull out their phones or laptops and try along right with them. Um, and I, we used to have a rule around Hacker Year that there should be no slides during demo. I'd love to see this happen at one day. It's something you should think about. Um, but it, slides can definitely help uh, a company get by. So recruiting, right? So it's, we have to address people are here to recruiting. They're definitely not here all the time for being a product. And as a hacker, you probably have a good idea of what effective recruiting looks like, right? We want genuine, humble people uh, who are really just there to like, make sure everyone has a great experience. So they're not, you can identify this. And the best thing a company that's recruiting can do is send someone technical. I know we all say this all the time. Engineers work better than recruiters. Uh, CEOs and founders are cool, but energy, engineers will have the most effect on, uh, for a sponsor. Uh, some ideal candidates are people from a company who've authored or contributed to a significant project, solved an interesting problem, and they can share a story about the journey, or they failed at something. So I want to share quick, two quick stories. Uh, this is Bjarne Stroudstrup. I hope I said that right. Uh, he, more, he works at Morgan Stanley. He's the creator of C++. Uh, they brought him to give a talk at uh, HackRU, which was really cool. It was, it, it was their idea to bring it, and it went over so well. People were walking around posing for pictures with him. Uh, and this was just an incredible experience. So this is something you can definitely ask for. Uh, tell them the stories about, you can get these types of people at your hackathons. You just have to think about it. And on that note, this is Chris uh, Wanstrath. Uh, I said his name wrong. Uh, but he is the CEO of GitHub. Uh, and so he was at Hack uh, BCA3, which is a high school hackathon in New Jersey. So it's kind of in the middle of like nowhere in New Jersey. Uh, and the CEO of GitHub came and gave an opening keynote. And you might think, like, how did that happen? Well, somebody sent him a cold email just randomly off the bat. They weren't even sponsoring the event. So these are things that you can think about. You can reach out to these people and send a, a cold email, and there might be a good chance that they come. So just go through uh, all the cool people that you think are out there in the world. Uh, and obviously, you're going to have to have people sometimes who are non-technical at your event. Uh, and this is something that you can still make sure they're able to inspire and equip the people in the room with. Uh, if, if they know the projects that are at the company, right? So if someone who's non-technical, who's a recruiter, can get on stage and say, hey, here are the problems that we're solving at XYZ Company. We'd love to have you come do this. Here's our tech stack. Here's all the, the scale at which we process requests every day. These are just things that they might know, uh, but they might not know that that's the cool things to share. Uh, cultures and values are great things to talk about. Something you should not do, though, is you should not show a video of what your office looks like and how cool it is to work there. Um, so, uh, I think that you can educate uh, your sponsors to make the opening ceremony great again. So, thank you so much. My name is Eddie Zaneski. It's been a pleasure. I'll be here all weekend. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Thanks, buddy. Uh,